Welcome to Module 2.2, Identifying Transmission in a Healthcare Cluster. This presentation is a part of the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit from CDC's Office of Advanced Molecular Detection. My name is Nicholas Lennertz, and I'm a physician and epidemiologist at the Minnesota Department of Health. This is the second set of three case studies that we will review to provide insight into how whole genome sequencing can be used as an investigative tool in outbreak settings. Be sure to check out the toolkit's other modules, which include a combination of case studies and training materials to help get you started supplementing epidemiology with genome sequence data. As an overview, two separate outbreaks were identified at two skilled nursing facilities in an urban metropolitan area. Both facilities identified COVID-19 positive staff and residents. Concerned facility leadership brought these outbreaks to the attention of the Minnesota Department of Health or MDH, and requested assistance to manage the outbreak. MDH helped both facilities implement system-wide serial testing, also known as point prevalence surveys, in order to understand the magnitude of transmission and to provide information on mitigation strategies, including cohorting. We'll start with facility A. At the start of the outbreak, this facility was comprised of 78 residents and 156 healthcare personnel. MDH performed serial testing of all residents starting on April 30th and ending on June 11th. This testing revealed that the outbreak was far more extensive than originally believed. Of the residents, 66% had a positive COVID test, while 35% of those healthcare workers that agreed to be tested had a positive test result. Of note, only a fraction of the healthcare workers actually agreed to be tested in both facility A and facility B. So the number of positive cases may have been much higher. Here are the epi curves for facility A residents and healthcare workers. You can see several cases identified prior to facility-wide testing on April 30th. These are the individuals that were identified as positive that triggered the outbreak response by the Department of Health. You can also see that in facility A, there was a much larger outbreak uncovered with the serial testing that began on April 30th. It's a similar story with facility B. Several cases in late April triggered reaching out to the Department of Health. Facility-wide testing on May 7th revealed a very large outbreak where 63% of residents and 33% of the healthcare workers willing to be tested were positive for COVID-19. And here is the epi curve for facility B. It's interesting to note for the healthcare workers in the lower curve, many positive tests did not take place on the dates of the serial testing. That's identified by the vertical dashed lines. This was due to facility B having the ability to test the workers when they came to work so that those who were not able to be at the facility on the date of serial testing were still able to be tested on other dates. Now these facilities faced several challenges that were only exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. These are high risk congregate settings with very vulnerable adults. In particular, both facility A and facility B were chronically short staffed. Having multiple healthcare workers test positive only made it more difficult to provide the proper care to residents. These difficulties provided ample opportunity for viral entry into the facility. Overworked staff, new staff, inconsistent training, PPE shortages, and limited training on correct donning and doffing procedures, space limitations, and the difficulty of caring for residents in memory care units all suggest multiple entry points and opportunities for the virus to get into the resident population. But the question remained, is this what really happened? Did multiple breaches of unidentified COVID positive individuals into the facility lead to an outbreak? How were these outbreak cases related? Did they match cases that were happening out in the community? Answering these questions would allow for a more nuanced understanding of the transmission patterns in these facilities, offering a more specific response to the outbreaks. As such, two hypotheses were formulated. Hypothesis one held that all the cases were related and that SARS-CoV-2 had rapidly spread unnoticed throughout the facility. Hypothesis two held the opposite that multiple introductions of the virus due to the reasons stated previously contributed to the outbreak. In order to answer our hypotheses, we turned to whole genome sequencing. 
So we collected as many samples as we could. One of the limitations in this situation was the availability of samples. Not all samples were retained by the labs that did the initial testing, and not all the samples were able to provide a full genome. This is especially true for the staff at Facility B, as most of their positive specimens were tested at an out-of-state lab, who then discarded the samples per their protocol. The total sample sequence for residents and staff at both facilities is seen here. As you can see here in the lower left-hand corner, we have a phylogenetic tree of various SARS-CoV-2 sequences in Minnesota. Focusing your attention on this part of the tree highlighted in green, we have zoomed into this clade. Here, outbreak cases from facility A have been coded in blue. The first thing that you can see is that all the outbreak cases cluster into this single clade. All of these cases share an internal node, which suggests they shared a common ancestor. The cases here along this vertical line are genetically identical. This means that there are no single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNP differences between the sequences from these cases. This finding suggests that the cases represented along this vertical line may have acquired SARS-CoV-2 from a common source. The other sequences in this clade have SNP differences. And as you can see here, a scale representing one SNP difference. For example, any of the cases along this vertical line are one SNP different from this case here. Any of the cases along this vertical line are three SNPs different from this one over here. These SNP differences represent mutations that likely accumulated as SARS-CoV-2 spread throughout this facility. Overall, this phylogenetic tree supports the conclusion that all the outbreak cases descended from a single introduction into the facility. Now we are focusing on facility B. Cases from facility B are color coded in purple. As you can see, there is a similar finding as to what we observed in facility A. Similarly, all cases in facility B cluster into a single clade and here, the internal node suggests a common ancestor. Many case isolates sequences are identical to each other while others have accumulated SNP differences but are still highly related at the genetic level. Again, supporting the inference that the outbreak resulted from a single introduction. The use of whole genome sequencing identified a phylogenetically related cluster of cases at both of these facilities. Sequencing data suggest that it only takes a single introduction of the virus into facilities such as these to result in a horrible outbreak with tragic consequences. MDH recommended continued vigilance with regards to infection prevention control practices and a very low threshold to test residents and staff. In addition, screening and universal testing in order to identify and isolate cases early must be part of the operational plan. Now, there are limitations. Not every case at either facility A or B could be sequenced. Over 80% of healthcare workers from both facilities were never tested for various reasons. And it is possible another outbreak cluster of a different lineage or sequence was never identified. Additionally, it is important to remember that unsampled cases could represent missing cases in the transmission chain. Another limitation to consider is that two cases with identical genomes or genomes that are very similar could represent two separate introduction events. This concludes module 2.2. Part three of this toolkit focuses on useful tools and skills to apply genomic data, and in particular, to integrate that data with the epidemiologic or clinical data. Please visit the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit page, where you can find further reading on this topic. On the toolkit page, you can also subscribe to our mailing list and receive announcements as new modules and materials are released. Thank you.